Um, if you've got a Bible there, turn to Luke uh, chapter 9. We're going to keep looking at the same verse we've been looking at for the last three or four weeks. That is Jesus' declaration to his followers. If anyone desires to come after me, anyone, which includes you and me, um, hands up if you think you're outside the scope of anyone. Is there anyone here that feels like they're outside the scope of that one? Good, that's great. So we're all on the same page. So when we read this, we all realise that we can't just rush over it and gloss over it to the next miracle of Jesus. Which, anyone like that? I love going to the miracle passages because I love reading about the miracles and the power of God and all that stuff. Um, but there's a lot of things in there, as I've been saying, that, my goodness, I wish Jesus didn't say. My life as a Christian would be so much easier uh, if Jesus didn't say certain things and didn't prep me for certain things that, that are going to come our way uh, in life, uh, who, who, who came to Jesus under the guise that everything was going to be perfect from that moment on? Anybody fall for that message? No, I, I know many, many people over the years I've seen, they have believed that. The minute you come to Jesus, life will be utterly perfecto and nothing bad will happen. And then at the slightest road bump, they turn around and they get angry at God. As if God was the one that falsely advertised himself. Unfortunately, he's not falsely advertising himself. Sometimes we're falsely advertising him, unfortunately, and so it's important that we be uh, in this thing called the Bible, the, the Word of God, the, the 66 ancient documents that have been collected over a period of 1,500 years, and thankfully for us, they've been bound together in one cover. We call it a Bible. Uh, it's great that we don't walk in here with 66 ancient parchments under our arm, going, wonder which one will be unrolling today. Uh, we just pick up one book and turn. The pastor or whoever speaking says, flick to this, and we flick to it. If we can't find it, there's an index. There's numbers and all that, so life's easy for us in terms of that. But we need to make sure, let me encourage you. Uh, I know we live in a day and age, and I talk to a lot of young people, and uh, you know, it's amazing how many believers never pick this book up, never look at it, never open its pages, never read it. Uh, don't read it just to try to understand it. It's not, it's not an Encyclopedia Britannica of the Christian faith. That's not what it is. We don't need to read it to study and understand all the intricacies. Uh, I like what James says. James says that the Word of God is like looking into a mirror. It's like looking into a mirror. What do you see when you look into a mirror? You get a reflection of exactly what you look like at that particular moment. The good, the bad, the ugly. And that's what happens when we get into this thing. It's like looking into a mirror. It tells me who I should be. And at times it points out who I'm, who I'm not. And, and at times it points out that I've got a bit of smudge and makeup on. Well, not makeup, but you know, makeup. <laughs> well, not, there's anything wrong with that. But, um, you know, I've got, got, got a bit of grease or something under the left eye or the hair's not done properly or something like that. It reflects back to me where I'm at so I can walk away then and maybe make the necessary uh, adjustments and, and so on. So uh, be in this book. Get a, get a plan or something, read this book, please don't be a generation, I talk a lot to young people and I have a genuine concern that we're going to end up in a generation's time with a bunch of people who are biblically, totally, and utterly illiterate because we don't read it anymore. And it's not enough to come on Sunday and somebody else tell you what it says. Read it, get it into your spirit, make it a part of your world. Um, this is what Jesus wants. Um, but there's a lot of things that Jesus said um, about what it means to follow him. And one thing he definitely didn't say was that it was all going to be beer and skills or a bit of roses or the terminologies. It's not going to be um, pain-free. It's not going to be um, always comfortable. It's definitely not always going to be popular. Who's found that following Jesus is not the popular option for life these days? If you want to be, if you want to be popular with everybody, if you want to fit in, if you want smooth sailing, the best thing you can do is find out what the majority think, how the majority live, what the majority look like, and mimic that. And then you'll have the least amount of persecution, ridicule, and rejection. Unfortunately, uh, if we're going to follow the path of Jesus, we're sometimes like that picture of the fish swimming upstream in the opposite direction to the rest of them. We're going to, uh, we're going to draw attention at times, and we're going to cop a bit of persecution, a bit of criticism. In fact, we won't go into it, but Jesus promised it, didn't he? He said, if they persecute me, what do you think I'll do here? <laughs> they reject me, they don't like me, what do you think they're going to do to those that think I'm okay and follow me and believe the stuff that comes out of my mouth? So we shouldn't be rocked by that. But this is one of those statements. <laughs> in the last few weeks, we've looked at it. Uh, first week, I think we looked at it in Mark. Last week, we looked at the same passage in Matthew. This week, I want to draw your attention to the same passage in Luke. It's exactly the same passage, but I just want you to see that all uh, those three writers, they all testify. And this, this was something Jesus actually said. Sometimes you read uh, stories in the Bible, and there are somewhere one or two 
authors recognised that and were led by the Holy Spirit to write that incident down. But there are some that are broad brushed and everybody noticed them. And this is one of those situations. The Holy Spirit wanted all these guys to make sure that they recorded this particular conversation, this statement. And the statement's this. Then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. If anyone wants to come after me, personalise it. If you want to come after Jesus, if you desire to come after Jesus, then this is for you. Jesus is saying, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him. So we've been looking at what that means in the last few weeks and we've been breaking it down. And um, just a very quick summary because I want to finish up with it today. Uh, Very quickly, first thing we looked at was the first thing Jesus said, anyone who desires to come after me. To desire means to have it in mind to resolve. Basically, it's a decision. It's not based on how you feel. It's a decision that you want to follow after Jesus. I wonder if I ask you to think about that question for a second. Have you made the decision to follow after Jesus? Have you actually made that decision? And you know that you've made the decision because it will be evidenced by choices that you make after. If you look at your lifestyle and the choices that you make and you know that they're not uh, congruent with a decision to follow Jesus, then, then just be honest with yourself and go, well, this is where I'm going. Who would, it would be terrible to get there one day and stand before the Lord and think that you're in and have him be like, uh, was it Matthew 26, 28, somewhere there? The sheep and the goats, and they go, but we did all these wonderful things, and we were, we were, we thought we were in. And he says, you know what? I didn't know who you were. You thought you were following me based on what? Did, did, did you, did you listen to my words? Was it based on what I said a follower looks like, or was it just based on popular opinion? Was it based on the latest book? What was it based on? Because I've made it very clear to you what a follower looks like and what I'm asking you to do. Because I've got this amazing life thing. This is the thing. God has such an amazing life for us. It's ludicrous that we fight so hard to have the life that we think is best when we've got this all-knowing, all-loving God up there who has nothing but a good time in in store for you. And by good time, I don't mean pain-free, but what I mean is you're not going to find fulfilment in what you think fulfills you over and above what God thinks fulfills you. The peace that we search for in life, thinking if I could have this, do this, be there, and we pursue it and chase it with all our might, if we would surrender to God, He will take us to a place where there's a peace that way surpasses anything that I've seen ever going to give you. This is the life that God has an offer for us. It's an exchange of what we want for what He has for us and what He wants to give us. And God's smarter than you. He knows better than you and He's got better things in store for you. But we live in a world that doesn't support that concept. We live in a world that puts it back on you and goes, hey, you know what's best. You, you, you're smart. You're intelligent. You've lived. You've copped a few. You know how it works. You know what the truth is? We've got to surrender ourselves and go, I, I, I think I know how things work, but it doesn't matter what I know. God knows better. I've got to make that decision. So have you made that decision? The second part we looked at was deny himself. If anyone would come after me, desires to come after me, let him deny himself. And uh, ladies, don't do this to your husbands just because it says himself. It's Kathy you don't deny yourself. It's not that. That word is, is gender neutral. In other parts of the Bible, the same words translated herself, themselves, and so on. But if we want to come after him, if we've made the decision to come after him, the first thing that we start doing is we start denying ourselves. Let me ask you this question Are you aware that God has plans and purposes for your lifetime and that you'll have a part to play in that? Are you aware that, that, that God is not just sitting in heaven and, and, and He loves us? Let me make that very clear. But God's not sitting in heaven going, I love Jackie so much that I'm going to do everything that's absolutely perfect for Jackie and forget the rest of you. Anyone seen that movie, um, Bruce Almighty? Anyone seen that Jim Carrey movie? Now remember the scene where he lassoes the moon. Anyone can, and he pulls the moon in. And then he's there with his, with his, his fiancée and just a beautiful romantic scene and the moon's there. And, I mean, for him, that was just perfect and she was having the best night. But then the next morning on the news, there's this news story. Breaking news, a tsunami hits Japan. Why? Because the moon was moved. So there's a massive tsunami. Thousands of people are killed. So, so God's not going to just sit back and go, I'm going to do whatever's best for one particular individual. God is, is going, you know, I know it's best for each individual, but in terms of your life, I want you to be committed to working with me to do what's best for mankind. I want you to play your role in the bigger picture. And every one of us have a role that we play in the bigger picture. Like Jackie just said, uh, your times and seasons 
were ordained by God. Who believes that? Who thinks that they're, they're here in 2020 just by random chance? You could have easily just random chance been uh, born in Ethiopia in the year 204. If you believe that, go and, read, go and read the book of Acts. Paul talks about this. He says, you know what? He says, God preordained the, the times that men would be born and the seasons of their dwellings and the borders and boundaries and so God ordained that you would be here for such a time as this. God wants you here for a reason. So if God is doing something in the world at this particular time, then he wants you to acknowledge that and be open to playing your role in that. Are you aware that God has plans and purposes for your lifetime and you'll have a part to play in that. See, one of the things with Peter we looked at in this whole story, this whole scenario of denying yourself, taking up your cross, it actually starts with them declaring a wonderful a revelation to the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then, of course, Jesus goes, awesome, you've got it. Now that you know that, now I'm going to talk to you about God's bigger picture agenda. And he starts talking about his death and his burial and resurrection and what God is doing. And Peter pulls him aside, and we all went over this uh, the last couple of weeks. Peter pulls Jesus aside, and Peter says, that's not going to happen to you, Lord. He rebukes him. And then Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. He says, you're not mindful of the things of man, are things of God. You're just simply mindful of the things of man. You see, in that moment, here's what Peter was doing. I want you, Jesus, and I want you to fit into my agenda. Does that sound like a lot of believers? I, I, unfortunately, I feel like it is. I want you, God, but I want you to fit into my agenda. So, Lord, come into my life and then subject yourself to what I want. Jesus is trying to say to Peter, it works the other way. Peter, I want you to follow me and submit yourself to my bigger agenda. Because I have a bigger agenda. I have things that I want to do as well. God has plans and purposes. Always has. Go right back to the very first book of the Bible, Genesis. God had a plan. Go right through to the end. God has a plan. Read every book in between. God has a plan and a purpose, something that he wants to do throughout the ages to see people come to faith and to see people get the revelation of who he is. So I want to just finish up real quickly by looking at the next step of that process. He said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, make the decision to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Take up his cross. What does it mean? To take up your cross. Now, we live in a culture today where who's ever heard this, right? Oh, I've got a, I've got a sore toe, and I've been to the doctors and they can't fix my sore toe. It's, it's the unfixable toe they call it. They can't do anything about. But it's okay. Don't feel sorry for me. It's just my cross to bear. You ever heard that? It's just my cross to bear. Um, oh, look, I, I, I've got this really, really bad marriage. It's, it just doesn't work. But I'm sticking at it. It's just my cross to bear. I've got uh, this, this sickness. It's just my cross to bear. My, 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 my people don't understand me, but it's just my cross to bear. And we've turned the, the concept of carrying a cross into carrying some kind of burden upon our shoulders. That's, that's the way that, that, that carrying a cross is put across in our culture, you know? Uh, I'm, uh, I was brought up a Tigers fan. I, from that big, my grandparents made me go for the Tigers. I never had a choice. Uh, I know it's stupid, but it's my cross to bear. I'm just too loyal. I can't pick another team. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm so good looking. People pick at me. They feel inferior around me. I, I can't help it. I'm just too sexy for this world. It's my cross to bear. You know? What's funny? <laughs> Haven't you ever thought that? No. Maybe it's just me. Our cross, bearing our cross, it, it, it's come to, um, to, to mean carrying some kind of burden or living with some kind of burden. But that's not what it was that Jesus was talking about at the time. He wasn't saying, hey, if anyone desires to come after me, deny himself and pick up a great big burden and come after me. And then later on, and by the way, lay them burdens back on me and I'll take them on you because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Exactly. My burden is light. The burden of God is light. When we're yoked to Him, when we're working with Him, if you want to run off by yourself, then you, even, you can carry it yourself. But if we yoke ourselves to God, his, his yoke is easy, His burden is light. Jesus was not saying to the disciples, come and carry some kind of a burden. Here's what the cross represents. I want you to think about this. Jesus has just told them that He's about to die. He's told them there's a big picture of God. Now keep in context, before Jesus gets on the scene, there's 400 years of silence. From the last prophet 
to when Jesus comes on the scene, there's 400 years of silence. Israel had not heard from God for 400 years. Now, if you don't hear from someone for 400 years, you're going to assume they're doing nothing. Yep. I can not hear from someone for a year and just assume, well, they're doing nothing. Nothing's going on. They're out of my world. And this is kind of what Israel must have felt. 400 years of silence. Where is God? What is God doing? Maybe God's doing nothing. Maybe God's, doing, maybe God's given up on us. Maybe he's had a gut for it. Go back and look at our history. We've given him every reason to give up. Maybe he's just come to his wit's end and it's all over. Maybe, maybe, maybe. 400 years of silence. Jesus comes. These guys say, you're the Christ. And he goes, well, you've got it. Exactly. That Messiah that all the ancients spoke about, yes, I'm here. In other words, God's still been doing something leading up to this moment. God's doing something. I'm here in the moment. And God's continuing to do something. And then he goes on and he expands on what his part in that is. I'm going to be crucified, buried, and die. God is doing something, and here's my role in that. When Jesus took up his cross, what was he really doing? Well, he's dying for the sins of the world, yes. Becoming sin for us, yes. But ultimately, what was he doing? He was fulfilling the will of God for his life. Jesus kneels in the Garden of Gethsemane and what does he pray? Father, if it's okay with you, could you take this away from me? In other words, this plan that you've got for my life, if we could change it, that would be awesome. But not my will. In other words, my will is, Father, that we could do this another way. That's my will. I I, I wish that we could do it another way. But at the end of the day, I'm committed to not my will being done in my life, but I'm committed to your will being done. They come and they grab Jesus. And they take him away. And he ends up getting crucified on a cross. And then he resurrects. So while Jesus was down here, the purpose of God for his particular life was to take up that cross physically and to be crucified for the sins of mankind and so on. When Jesus said to his disciples, take up your cross and follow me, he wasn't at all saying to them, you need to take up your cross and when I'm crucified, there'll be 12 other crosses there and you'll all be nailed to them. That's not what he was asking them to do and that's not necessarily what they heard and it's certainly not what they did. That was Jesus' call That was the agenda of God for his life. The Son of God, Jesus, came to die, to be the sinless sacrifice for you and for me. Nobody else could do that. That was for him and him alone. So the cross is not some heavy burden you carry. The easiest way to explain what the cross is, the cross is the will and plan and purpose of God for your life. Jesus is saying this, deny yourself. If you're serious about coming after me, if you really want to come after me and be my disciple, here's what my disciples do. They have a whole bunch of agendas and ideas and things that they want to do. But in the midst of that, they also acknowledge that God is doing something and that God is on the move and they acknowledge that they have a role to play in that. And just like Jesus, every one of us have to come to a point where we're in our own garden of Gethsemane and we wrestle with this point. Is it my will or yours be done? Is it the plans and purposes of my life? Is my whole life just going to be about what I want? I mean, Jesus was... Why do you think Jesus asked the Father if there could be another way to do this? Probably because he knew it wasn't going to feel good. Probably because he knew it wasn't going to be comfortable. Probably because he knew that it wasn't, it wasn't going to bring fame or fortune or whatever it is that people chase these days. As disciples, carrying your cross means coming to the same place Jesus did where we decide it's not about my will anymore, God. It's about yours. My life's not primarily about what I want anymore. It's about what you want, God. Sometimes I want to sin. Why? Sin feels good. Anyone ever used to sin because it felt good? I did. And if it didn't feel good to you, you were doing it wrong. That's the attraction of sin. So, so we, 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 we want to do things. But in that moment, daily we make a choice to deny ourselves and go, I won't do that. Because that's not God's will. That's my will. I'm going to go God's way. 
Instead of watching that TV show with those images that I want to, there's, you know, I'm going to go this other way and turn the channel. Close the magazine. Walk on. Oh, instead of sitting here having that conversation about that third person that's not here to defend himself, I'm going to choose God's will and walk away and not engage in that kind of stuff. Daily we make decisions to either outwork our own will and what we want or the will of God. Now, I don't think any of us get to a point of absolute holiness where we don't wrestle with that. If you do, you're better than Jesus. Even Jesus, the sinless Son of God, kneels in a garden and says, Father, this sucks. This is going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. Well, God never said following him was going to all be rosy and easy and sweet. There were going to be tough decisions that needed to be made. But what he said is, I'll support you in those decisions, but you've got to make the decisions. I'll support you in that, but it comes back to your choice. Carrying the cross was not about carrying some kind of a burden. Look at what Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Paul writes this. He says, not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on. I love that. He's just acknowledging his own in, in humility. I haven't made it yet. I'm not perfect. I haven't got there. I am a work in progress. Put your hands up if you're a work in progress. That's great. You're going to be a work in progress till the day you leave this planet. That's the truth. You're never going to make it. You're not going to make it. You're going to have struggles and scars and battles. It's a part of life. But Paul says this. He says, even though I'm imperfect, even though I haven't made it, even though I haven't got it all together, he says, I press on. I love that. I press on. I press on. I keep going forward. You know, that's one of the, the mandates that we have here at Arise. One of the things we know God has said to us. Some, so if you want to go to a gathering and you want to uh, uh, sit there and, and just not grow, if you want to be comfortable to just stay where you are, this is not the place for you because we're going to prod and poke and, and, and gently nudge because we know that God has a great life for you. But we don't get it by just sitting down, wallowing in whatever it is we wallow in. We've got to make decisions and choices. And by the grace and power of God, stand up and walk. And you get knocked down, you get up again. And you walk and you get knocked down, you get up again. That's, that's what God wants for us. That's what Paul said. I'm just going to press on. I'm imperfect. I'm not all together. I make mistakes. I do things wrong. But I'm going to get up each time and press on and press on and press on. And here's why he's going to press on. Look what he says. I'm going to press on. Why? that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Think about that for a second. Christ Jesus laid a hold of you for something. He laid a hold of you for something. Now maybe you don't know what that something is. It's okay. But just press on. You press on. You press on. You press on. Paul says, I'm, I'm, I'm pressing on because I know that Christ Jesus laid a hold of me for something. And I'm going to keep pressing in to find that something. I want that something. I want that something that he laid a hold of me for. God's laid a hold of you for a reason. In other words, there is a purpose and a plan and a part for you in God's bigger agenda. It's not just about you. It's not just about me. There's a part that we play. What I love about that is this. If carrying a cross is all about, oh, this burden, brother, Again, just like last week we talked about denying yourself. If it's all the burden, that's a negative. Who wants it? Who's willingly going to do it? But it's not about the burden you carry. It's about picking up the call of God, the plans and purposes of God for your life. And that's positive. That's exciting. Because you're made for that. You were created for that. And that will make a difference in the world. How do you change the world? You change the world when... People like you and me wake up each day and go, I'm here for a reason today. So today, I'm going to take up my cross daily, the plan and purpose of God for my life today. I'm going to take it up and I'm going to walk in. 
You know, Mick, Mick uh, as Jackie said, done an absolutely amazing job here in, in Bevan. Um, we had a few other people come, but primarily sort of those two guys have been working on the stage here and stuff. And, you know, one of the things that, that, that um, uh, I, I've been saying to Mick the last few times I've come on in, uh, Mick's here and he's got his tools and he's doing all that stuff. Mick's doing all the stuff that I've got no idea how to do. I can't do it. I've got no idea how to do it. I mean, he sets his tools up and he's cutting and angling and all these things and, and, and I'm just looking and going, I, could, I just go, I've got no idea the stuff that he's doing. I could never do that stuff. So here's what I did. I came in and I said to Mick, I've got my computer up the back there. I said, Mick, I'm, I'm going to just do what I have to do. And I'm going to sit at the back and do what I have to do. But if you need me, Mick, you just call out. You just say, Alan, I'll, I'll, you know, I need your hand here. Come and hold this piece of wood. Um, come and, and, and do whatever. No, not wood, it's timber. See, I learned that too. Come and hold this timber. Come and hold this timber. Builders. Come and hold this timber. Anything you want me to do, you just tell me. So here's what I did. I just sat there and I did what I had to do. But in the midst of doing what I had to do, I made a decision that A, I'm going to keep my ears open while I'm doing what I've got to do. Because you know what? He might have a job for me. He might have something that he needs me to do. Now, he's doing all the hard work, really. I'm just there to come alongside him to help. To assist. Remember what follow means? Remember we talked about following about four or five weeks ago when Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. That word following means be an assistant too. That's what it means. Be an assistant too. So I came in here and I decided I was just going to be an assistant to me. And so I'm down there doing what I have to do. How many of you know there are things in life you have to do? You've got to go to work. You've got to pay the bills. You've got to eat meals. You've got to go to the toilet. You've got to, got to, got to take, take the kids to work. You've got to do all kinds of things that you've got to do. So you've got to do the stuff that you've got to do. But while you're doing the stuff you've got to do, you keep your ears open and you have an attitude that says, the minute you need me, I will drop whatever I need and I will come running. Whenever you need me, I'll stop what I'm doing and I'll come. Why do I stop what I'm doing and come? Because I made the decision while I was in here that what Mick was doing here was more important than what I was doing there. What Mick was doing here was more important than what I had going on over there. So based on that, Mick, the minute you need something, I'm ready to drop what I'm doing and come running over here to do what you want me to do. See, it's okay for me to have a will. It's okay for me to, to do things I've got to do. That's fine. I'm not saying that we sit back and do absolutely nothing to... No, no, no. The will of God is not some necessarily some big, bang, one unique thing that you have to do to go and build a massive building or start a huge ministry. The will of God is outward daily, like taking up your cross. It's a daily decision that you make. It's an absolute daily decision that you make. Whose will is more important to you today? Right now, whose will is more important to you? You or God? Whose agenda is primary in your mind right now? Is it your agenda or God's? Every one of us are going to end up like Jesus. Well, we're going to have to be on our knees in our own Gethsemane and answer that question. Whose will, whose agenda is more important, yours or God's? You know, some weeks we get, I get to chuck out Mars bars and ice creams and we have nice messages. Some weeks it's more chocos and there's a choco message, vegetables. But we've got to hear this stuff. We've got to wrestle with some of the stuff that Jesus talked about. Taking up your cross was about the will and the purpose and the plan of God. Jesus' cross physically was that part that he had to play in the bigger plan of God. God didn't stop working once Jesus was crucified and resurrected. That was a part of the bigger plan. And that plan, the focus and centre of that plan was not Jesus or God, it was man. To redeem man. If man was not focused and we were just a peripheral, then, then Jesus wouldn't necessarily have to die. It would be, eh, shouldn't we, shouldn't we, eh. I don't know. Let's just hang around and watch how they go and we'll make a mind up. But God so loved the world. He gave you another son. He so loved the world. And every day we get to wake up and play a tiny, tiny role in seeing his plans and his purposes come to pass or to fight for our own plans and purposes knowing that we can build great things and do wonderful things but they're temporal moth and rust will destroy them eventually what God's doing won't be destroyed 
Who comes to him one day the story. Somewhere along the line, being a disciple became about praying prayer. Just close your arms about your head and just pray this prayer. You're in, brother. You made it. Can't find anywhere. Anywhere. In these ancient documents that our faith is based upon, where becoming a disciple is based on praying prayer. It's not in there. Somewhere along the line, being a disciple became about praying and prayer. But according to Jesus, it's actually about living a daily life. It's like repentance. I was just talking to Jackie the other day. I want to do a, a message on repentance at some point because it's so misunderstood. We think repentance is a prayer. Well, Lord, I'm sorry. It's not repentance. Repentance is an action. The word repent means to do a 180. It means to stand here, play around with something I shouldn't be, and that's stand there and go, Lord, I'm sorry, while I still stand here. Play with it again. Go, oh, sorry, Lord. Repentance has got nothing to do with sorry. Lord. Repentance is, oh, look at it go, that's not good. I do a 180 and I look one. Being a disciple is not about a prayer you pray. It's about a life that you live. And I think God wants us to get back to that. Because the prayers that we pray, that's wonderful. But it's the life that you live that is a lie. It's the life that, the life that you live itself in the community and in the world around you. Matthew 7, verse 21, Jesus actually said these words. He said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father. So the Father has a will. We've all got to get down on our knees in our own garden and wrestle with it. What's my life going to look like? What's my life going to be about? What's my day going to be about? Is it, is, it, is it going to be about my own dreams, agendas, plans and goals? And again, just like when I came in with Nick, I had, I had plans and agendas, I had stuff I had to do, nothing wrong with that. But I hold it at a distant second to the call of Nick. If he wants me to come and do something, then that sits on the shelf. I don't sit there and go, well, hang on, I'll just finish my, my five years of uni first. Or I'll just finish this, or I'll, just, I'll, get, I'll get back to none and I go, you want me to do something? You call him, you speak to me? Then, Lord, I'm going to do it. Because at the end of that, I one shot at life. This morning, when you walked in here this morning, you don't get it back. I don't care how hard you try and smart you are, unless you've got your own, um, what's that car called in the back of the future? DeLorean. Unless you've got your own DeLorean, you've just lost it. It's all over. And do I live it for the glory totally of myself? Or is there something in me that goes, you know, oh God, I want to be a part of that big picture purpose of what you have planned with. Let me, let me summarise this passage. If anyone would follow me, anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Let, 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 me, let me just give you my own little summary of how I would take that if I was writing the NAV, the New Allen version. Which I'm not, by the way. If you want to be clear. Let me summarise this. The defining characteristic of a disciple is someone who makes a daily decision to unashamedly and publicly live out the will of God in their lives. It's not somebody who prayed a prayer once and said, Lord, come into my heart. Lord, would you come into my heart? He doesn't want to come into your heart, he wants to come out through your entire being. The defining characteristic of a disciple is someone who has made a daily decision unashamedly and publicly without the will of God in their lives. Two real quick things about the cross. You know, Jesus didn't have to take up that cross. You know that? Chosen. Going to Gethsemane when the soldiers came running in and one of his disciples wanted to defend him with a sword, he said, Hang up. Don't you know I'm calling my father and get legions of angels and get me out of this mess if I want to. Number one, your cross is something you've got to choose to pick up. Even Jesus chose to pick up. He made that declaration just after he's wrestled in the garden and already decided on his knees, you know what? I've made my mind up. So it doesn't matter what comes. You can come at me with guns and spears. It doesn't matter. You can come at me with pitchforks and torches. You can take me before Roman emperors. You can nail me to a cross. I've made my mind up. It's not my will, God. It's yours. The second thing about a cross is that people carry them publicly. 
You never saw a missing person who's out on the back of a milk carton for someone who's crucified on the cross. Everybody knew. Everybody knew. Because they'll march through the streets. They will, they will put up on hills. They'll pull on major highways coming in and out of Rome. People hanging there. Rome's way of saying to everybody, mess with us and this will be good. A great definition of a disciple. Someone who makes a daily decision to unashamedly and publicly live out the will of God in their lives. I want you to think about that. I want you to have a think about that. Are you someone who daily makes the decision to put the will of God first? Are you someone that publicly and unashamedly will stand for Jesus? How many of you know we're living in times where publicly and unashamedly are not going to become just concepts? They're real life tangibles for many people. And it's heading that way here. I often say to, to, to young people, I think the toughest people in the world are those that follow Jesus. I think it's the hardest thing. It's the hardest thing. And if you're young, you know what I'm talking about. It's unpopular. You lose friends. You get picked on. You get targeted. You thought to be this. You thought to be that. Takes guts to sing for Jesus. It's easy to walk away from him. Takes courage to sing. Anyway, Lord, thank you for your word. And Father, thank you for this challenge. And God, I pray for every person here this morning, God. Lord, we're a part of anyone. You said if anyone desires to come after you, God, learn to deny themselves and take up their cross name and follow after you, Lord. So God, I, I, I pray for each person here. Uh, Lord, this might not be... Um, Lord, it's certainly not my favourite verse in the Bible. It's very much down the bottom, to be honest, but um, it's true. And so Lord, I pray for each person here. God, I pray that you would cause us to wrestle with this verse, not just say, that's great, we've got a few weeks on this, let's move on to the next thing. Let us wrestle with this concept of discipleship, Lord. None of us want to be those people that get there and say, didn't we do this and didn't we do that? And you look us in the eye and you say, part of it, no, you can't. Let that not be the testimony of any person in this room, Father. And Lord, thank you that the cross is not a negative, burdensome thing, Father. It's a positive, it's exciting, it's the plan and purpose of God. It's where we get to walk in miracles, signs and wonders. It's where we get to walk in the power of God. It's where we join arms with the Holy Spirit and we make a difference in the eternal lives and destinations of people all around this planet, Father. So thank you. For that reality, God. And I pray in the next seven days as each of us uh, leave here, give every single person in this room, give every one of us an opportunity to tell somebody about you, God. Somebody out there that up to this point right now doesn't realise how much you love them. Let us tell them in the next seven days, Father. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. Amen. You